first question is, I think, the most pressing, and that is how do we help our kids with the big feelings that they are experiencing having lost their summer programs, many of them? Right. And the answer to that is incredibly simple and incredibly difficult as parents. The answer is empathy. It's so, so much something that we want to do, and maybe you can relate to this from when you were parenting tweens and teens especially, is we want to tell them how to feel. We want to tell them how not to feel. And you and I have talked before about how telling someone how to feel or how not to feel is, um, well, it's a little bit like if I said to Adrian, oh, your feelings are dumb. Have different feelings. <laughs> and and that's, that's not what empathy looks like. The first thing we can do for our kids is have either quiet empathy, where we're just sitting next to them, right? We've talked about this a little bit, but at a shiva, you're, when you pay a shiva call, we're actually told you're not supposed to say anything. You're just supposed to be quiet near the person and take your cues from them. Right. And in that same way, we would do well to take our cues from our kids about the empathy that we're giving them and not jump in with, well, at least nobody we know has passed away from this, or at least you know you still get, you know, your friends aren't going either, or some at least, at least really minimizes the feelings you're having when you're in that first swell of them. Oh, so boy, have I heard that a million times about anything. Adults do it to each other all the time. And we do it to ourselves. You know, we, we don't give ourselves any grace, which, by the way, a lot of us as parents are also having some grief about our summer looking tremendously different than we had pictured, right. um, you know, those opportunities. But for our kids, the first thing we can do is let them experience that wave of grief without us telling them how they should feel or how they shouldn't feel or trying to jump to solutions. We have to be thinking about possible solutions, but letting them experience those emotions at first, not letting them stay in that spot forever. How but long? Giving them a few how days. long? Right, it totally depends on your child. I mean, my eldest son was supposed to be staff at an overnight camp this summer in Wisconsin, and mm -hmm. he's grieving not just his summer job, which was employment and money he needed to earn that now he needs to replace, but also he's moving to, making Aliyah and moving to Israel in August, and so he's mourning his last opportunity quite possibly to see dozens of people whom he genuinely adores. And I don't know, you tell me, how long is it okay to be sad about that, right? I guess it's, I guess it's dependent on how they act yes. out with it. What is it though? Ah. All of my girlfriends are telling me their kids are apoplectic. What is it about camp that okay. is so Power. So that was your second question, and it's such a good question. There's a lot of research about this, about the good that camp, overnight camp and day camp and any other summer program yeah. does for kids, uh, especially overnight camp. If, if you've had that experience, this will ring for you, but we see it in all kinds of summer programs. They really get four things from this. Kids get connection, they get purpose, they get fun, and they get independence. And those four things the bad news is, wow, camp is rife with that and it's made for it and they're experts at giving it to our kids. The good news is, you asked me what kids will lose. They don't have to lose connection, purpose, fun, and independence this summer. But you just have to think differently about how to help them go after those things. Okay, I don't mean to interrupt, but isn't the reason that they get all those things in such high doses and that they love it because you're not there? Yes, yes. There's a great book by a psychologist named Michael Thompson, who he wrote this book called Homesick and Happy, uh, as opposed to Homesick But Happy, where he asked thousands of adults their experiences when they learned the most, grew the most, became the things they most admire about themselves. And all these adults told him stories about times when their parents weren't there. Right. Um, mostly at, at camp experiences, but not only, but really when we look back, we look back at moments where we had to decide, we had to choose, we had to step up. And camp is better suited, but also bet more expert in giving our kids those opportunities. So we're going to have to stretch ourselves a little bit this summer as adults to give our kids and our teens and our young adults more chances to step up a little bit. Uh, okay, where would you begin with that? For example, I'm the mother that let my kid wear rollerblades and go to um, a grocery store at 10 years old. We are downtown people, we live in the city. I knew that if someone bothered him, he'd kick them with those rollerblades. My other child, for example, I couldn't allow him to do that until he was 12 or 13. How do you decide what is appropriate in terms of independence? Because surely they need it. They do need it. And you're asking me the hardest but best my favorite question about parenting. Um, on my website, I answer questions about resilience uh, for kids in our lives, for ourselves, and also at work. And the most popular question I get about kids is, how old should a child be to anything? 
Right. And I always say, I don't know, but you do because you're an expert in the kids that you're raising. So just like you were expert enough to know that this kid was ready at a different age than another kid, and I know parents of multiple children, I'm one of them, is, are gonna say, but they're gonna say it's unfair. Right. Yes, because equal is not necessarily fair. We talked about that last time. Yeah. Uh, but what I really want you to think about is how do you decide, right? This is the question I love to answer. How do I decide if the child who's looking at me and says, I am old enough to go, you know, I want to get more fit this summer. Well, that feels great to hear as a parent. So I want to be allowed to go jogging by myself in our neighborhood. How do I decide if my child, and it doesn't actually matter how old they are, um, unless they are too short to be seen over the hood of a car, we've got a different conversation. Right. But if they are physically large enough to cross the street safely, if they have the know-how, then that's what you got to think about. So I ask parents to do a couple of things beforehand. You say to your child, good question. I will get back to you. Don't get pressured into a knee-jerk answer. And I remind my kids, if you pressure me into a knee-jerk answer, most often it's not going to be the answer you want. So really? when I tell you that I need you to wait, you should believe me because you're, you're more likely, no guarantees, to get the answer that you're aiming for. Oh my gosh, that is that should be a meme because <laughs> boy, oh boy, well, what about the mom, 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 you just like mom, mom, mom. Maybe that was just my house. Right. No, no. I have a friend who made her, her kids for an entire weekend call her no but mama. She wouldn't <laughs> answer to anything but no but mama, just to make the point that they were saying that too much. And it seemed to work, she said, for a while. So the first thing I want you to do after you step away from the persistent poking child or mm -hmm. teen, they poke differently, but they're even better at it, right. is say to yourself, okay, what am I genuinely worried could happen? So let's use that example of a child going running in your neighborhood, whatever your neighborhood looks like. Okay. Um, so I don't want you to think about the two o'clock in the morning abducted by aliens, really unlikely to happen kinds of worries. I mean, the practical, if you saw it on the news and you thought, what was that parent thinking? What would you actually think could go wrong? Okay, so let's say that the three most biggest concerns would be that my child would be snatched by someone, Mm -hmm. that they would get lost or that they would get hurt. So those seem to be pretty, getting abducted by someone is actually very, very, very low, low chance, uh -huh. but it's high worry. It's very high stakes. So let's consider those. And, you know, getting lost, that's middling possible, especially if your child has my sense of direction, sorry. Um, and getting hurt, very common, like very likely. Right. So then I want you to think about, okay, what does my child need to know to be okay in each of those three situations. So you go back to your child and you give a pretest, like every second grade spelling teacher. You say, okay. So I say to you, well, Adrian, what if you were running and you noticed that, um, and, and someone tried to walk up to you and talk to you? Or uh, a, a, a white van, a, let's go the whole stereotype, a, a windowless like a white van, van. <laughs> right, with a, with a scary person, not wearing a mask, everyone's wearing a mask, but you know, a scary person behind it pulls alongside you. And if your child goes, uh, I, I don't know, they're not ready. But if your child says, um, I would go to an open door of a house that has a play set in the yard, or I would start going backwards because the van couldn't easily back up, or if they have something that's like, spot on, then okay, maybe they're ready. That's reasonable. Or okay, they hold say- on a second. Hold on, hold on. That's brilliant, first of all. It never even occurred to me. Can you give them like advanced responses a few days before? Um, so I wouldn't see the pot quite that close, but I will tell you that just one parenting lesson is that I always tell my kids, if you're ever lost, and this is the example I was gonna give next, I want you to go up to a woman with children. I'd be willing to guarantee she doesn't want another. <laughs> And that to be rid of the responsibility of a lost child in a really helpful, wonderful way, she'd be happy to let you use her cell phone. Oh. So you go up to, and you stand six feet away, but you go two meters away for our Canadian folks, from a, um, from a, a woman with children and you say, hey, excuse me, I am lost, may I use your phone to call my parent? You're, you're going to get a yes. If they have a phone, you're going to get a yes. Right. Um, Another thing that I've taught my kids, which is just a good life lesson that you might give a few days or a week before you have this conversation with your child is if someone comes up to you that freaks you out, I don't want you to yell, ah, because Adrian, picture yourself at your own sink in your own home and you live in the city as I do. And you right. hear a child outside scream. You stop for a second and you listen. 
But weirdly, if the screaming stops, we go back to what we were doing. That's right. True. We assume it's okay. But if, what if you heard from your kitchen sink out your window, a child yell, leave me alone. I don't know you. You're a stranger. Mm. You would out your door with your cell phone in your hand in two seconds flat. Oh, you're right. So that's what you teach your kids to yell. Get your hands off my brother or I don't know you. You're a stranger. I don't you know, just yell that word stranger and every person with any sort of child protective instinct will be outside investigating in a super nosy way really quickly. Oh, that's brilliant. There are ways. Now, some people live in rural areas and have other concerns, but we all know our neighbors and our situation in an expert way that me on this, this conversation with you, you and I can't know what somebody's thinking about, but I want you to think, so, okay, they tell me if they got lost. Yep. That sounds reasonable. Um, I'd stay where I am, you know, not just keep wandering. I would wait for, you know, someone with, um, you know, or I would knock on someone's door, but then back way up, get, you know, 20 feet, or that'd be about four, you know, four meters away and say, hang on, you know, I just, could you by any chance toss your phone out here? Cause I don't want to get too close to somebody I don't know, but I'm, I'm lost and I need to call home. And then the getting hurt, you have to ask them, what would you do? And you don't say like, well, but what if you got hurt? You say, okay, I'd like to think about some situations that will happen to you at some point, getting lost and getting hurt, not getting abducted. It's much less common actually than people think. But if that's what's going to keep you on pins and needles the whole time your child is out exercising, I want you to be reassured that you've talked about it and you've thought about it and they've thought it through. I, I completely hear. It's interesting. You know, once when one of my kids was about 16, he had this big black ski jacket with a hood over it. And he was still my baby. And I said to him, I don't want you going out alone. And he said, mommy, I'm the person that people other people are worried about. about now. <laughs> yes. I'm the people other people warn their kids about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my, which, scary. Okay. So a lot of adults also have lost their travel opportunities and plans and kid free time. Right. Which, and kids at camp time. Yeah. Right. Right. Which is yeah. sometimes where people save their own marriages. So how do we manage our own feelings on that? What can we do? So first of all, I want you to give yourself the same grace you would give a friend who just had a really big loss. Like if they had something they were really looking forward to that, you know, through no fault of their own was lost to them, you'd be much kinder and more empathetic to them than you probably being to yourself. So recognize it as a loss and give yourself a little bit of time to feel your feelings about that. And then the same question I want you to ask your kids, which is, what do you love about camp? What feelings were you most looking forward to? Not experiences, because I don't know about you, but I can't recreate the tubing or the rock wall or the 70 people at Kihila or whatever it is. Um, but since I want you to not ask them about the experiences, but the feelings, oh, smart. what feelings were you most looking forward to? And what can you do? And how can I assist you? But independence, I want you to think about how you can recreate those feelings. For yourself, I want you to ask the same question. This is how we build resilience in ourselves. Yes, we're going to have losses and changes and have to learn to adapt to new circumstances. That will always be true, no matter what the cause is. So how do we learn the skill of grieving the loss and then going forward towards something positive, making choices and getting towards integration and reunification, which are those steps in resilience, that integration is, okay, what I wanted was time to myself to be on my own schedule or go on a date with my partner or whatever it is. Okay, the feeling I wanted was a feeling of connection to my partner or um, self-care time or whatever. So what can you do given the current parameters to still get that feeling. You might have to be really creative or really flexible in what you do, but in what you're accomplishing, you should really try and be specific with your goals because if you don't know how to accomplish that, so your child comes to you and says, every year my camp does a huge Tikkun Olam project and I feel so amazing being a part of this big group of people working towards the common good, working hard and really making a difference. Your child might have no idea how to recreate that this summer, but together the two of you can investigate because there are opportunities like that available, even given our current parameters. So if you say to me, what I wanted was that feeling of there's nobody around and it's just me and I can choose whatever I do with my schedule and whatever I do with whatever, I say, great, I may not be able to get you three weeks of that, but you could probably get you three hours of that. What would you do with it? How would you do that? Wow. 
You know what, what you said that's really profound for me is not to try and recreate experiences, but try and recreate the feelings around those experiences. That, that's really smart because the experience, you're right, it provokes the feeling. You know, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to give you one right now. Yeah. Um, um, I am terrified that a driver who isn't paying attention will hit my kid while they're biking. So many people, even in my neighborhood, are texting behind the wheel. I don't want to lock him inside, but I'm afraid. I completely understand that. And I hope without being like, you can't ever go outside because there are people texting and driving. I hope that you've shared your concerns with your child. And in a way that's like, hey, you and I both know better, but boy, I do see that. Do you see that? Because you have a bunch of things you could do. One, you could say to your child, what are some good solutions? You want to be able to ride your bike. I want you to be able to ride your bike. This is my concern. And they might say to you, well, how about if I only go places where I can ride on the sidewalks? Okay, it's a good start. Um, maybe that's not an option. What if they say, okay, I won't take any of the skinny streets. I'll take wide streets where I can stick to the curb and there's room for cars in the middle. They might say to you, um, or you might say to them, let's petition for some signs in our, from our city, our town council that says, you know, uh, the careful children at play signs that every municipality has their own version of that. Right. Um, but actual street signs and teach them how to affect change. When I was in fourth grade, I was riding my bike and I had a new friend that I made at school and I was really excited to ride to his house. And I noticed that at this particular intersection, people just went whipping through. And my dad said, well, what do you think is a good solution? And I said, there should be a light there. And he's like, ask. So I wrote letters. Remember writing letters? How I wrote you? letters. Uh, I'd have been nine. Wow, um, so great. I wrote letters to our town council asking for a red light. And what I got back was an explanation. They'd done an assessment actually a couple of years before of the intersections in our town. And they sent me the assessment for that and told me why they weren't going to put in a red light, but they put in a caution sign and a speed bump um, about, you know, 50 meters before it. So I, and that took a year and I had to, you know, take a different route to my friend's house in the meantime, but it got me really thinking and that purpose and independence are things that you can use your child's own motivation to be able to ride their bike more to engage them in those things. You know, you're, you're so right. It's interesting. I think about camp. I think about my kids or myself with a counselor who was like 17 looking after 24, 12 year olds. And I think, boy, I had a lot of freedom. I didn't even realize how much freedom I had. Okay. So speaking of teens, another question here, what about teens who are already exhibiting risky behavior? I'm in the Minneapolis area and my team wants to go to check out the areas where the protests were yesterday. I'd ask why. <sighs> so the first question I would ask any teen when they want to do something that scares you or that you don't understand is why. Not why could you be so stupid or why would you take that risk, but, or maybe just that question, why would you take that risk? You know, do, what, what do you understand the risks of that to be? And in as non-judgmental a way as you can, because your teen is preparing for a life of balancing risk with reward. That is what adulthood is. I bet most people listening have chosen to speed in one situation or another while driving, and they weighed the need to get where they were going with the money for a ticket or the risk of an accident given right. the road conditions. Most of being an adult is making choices based on understanding the circumstances. So if you think your child is not taking the time to think about the circumstances, which is different than not drawing the same conclusion you draw, <sighs> then I want you to really ask them, um, do you understand the risks that I feel are involved in going to that place? And they may say to you, well, yes, at night in the middle of the protests I do, but during the day I don't. Or they might say to you, yes, um, and you say, okay, why does it feel to you to be worth it? And they might say, you know, I have this, these followers on my social media who are saying that, the, that these concerns aren't valid. And I want to go show them what people who are afraid to go outside and just walk or just this or just that are experiencing. And I can't show them if I don't go or I need to see it for myself and understand what's happening. And then you say, okay, so those are really reasonable goals. Here's my concern about that. Is there anything you can do to either lessen the risk, going at a different time, going with an adult, what is it? Or is there a way you can get that information in a different way? Can you interview some of these people? You know, can you reach out to them over social media so you can learn without putting yourself in harm's way? Okay, I'm gonna ask you an off script question because I've been dying to know. Yes, when I was growing up, I had to come home when the lights went on on the street. Street lights, yeah, absolutely. Us city kids, totally. Yes. 
come home when the street lights came on. Is there such an exponential difference in risk for children now? There is not is actually media America, that makes us afraid. Yeah. I can't speak to Canadian uh, statistics, but in America, it is uh, quantitatively safer to be a child now in terms of abduction, uh, car versus pedestrian, car versus bike accidents. So those are the three big worries for parents. Uh, it is safer than it has been since 1957. My goodness. See, Which, I, so know, what is it? Is it all the media that creates the fear? Mostly it's a 24 hour news cycle. So um, I don't know if you remember when there was a girl who got stuck in a well in the United States oh, in the yes. 1970s. That was the first time that a child emergency situation was broadcast nationally and right. people hung on the updates. That one moment and a whole bunch of things that followed it really changed how we think about children and risk. Um, I have a friend who uses the 11 o'clock news litmus test in her mind when her kids come to her and they say, hey, can we go down to the beach and hang out? They live in a, a, a gated kind of resort community in the Pocono Mountains, and it's been there for decades and decades. It's really pretty safe. And she said, when they ask me something that gives me that feeling in my stomach of like, oh, it might not be safe, she said, I picture it. And I think, okay, what's the very worst, craziest thing that could happen? They could I don't know, one of them could accidentally be horsing around, push each other, well, somebody off the bridge, a kid drowns. If I saw that, God forbid, on the news, would I think either, oh, that's terrible tragedy, or would I think, what were those parents thinking letting their kids be on that bridge? And oh she said, God. and if I think, what were those parents thinking? I say no. And if I think, oh, that's just a terrible tragedy, I say yes. <laughs> that's, that's a great litmus test. You know, you won't know this, but women who live in, in Canada or certainly in Buffalo, New York, who remember this, there used to be an 11 o'clock thing that was called Eyewitness News, and this is how they signed on. It's 11 o'clock. Do you Do know, you know where, where your going? children are? You remember that? Yes. Actually, no, I remember the Saturday Night Live spoof of it. <laughs> okay, was it, that, that was my news. Okay, I'm yeah. asking you another question. I wish I could talk to you for hours. Many communities are just in the emerging phase from the stay-at-home orders, and what do you think is the best way to manage our anxiety and our kids' anxiety about moving about in the world? What do we do? So first of all, we cannot manage our kids' anxiety until we deal with our own. And I don't mean deal with like get rid of. I mean like face and come up with some strategies for. Everything in the world is about coping strategies. And a friend of mine said to me, you know, I'm hearing about so many fewer Jewish people getting this, and it's not true statistically, but I said, well, you know, if hypervigilance is helpful, we've been training up for this for millennia. So, oh. <laughs> um, so I understand the hypervigilance because now it's not failing a math quiz in fourth grade that we're staying awake at night about. It's a disease that's very dangerous and none of us have immunity to. Right. I have tons of empathy for the anxiety, but we also live with the reality of car accidents and lots of other bad things that can happen. And after a while, you find a way to deal. When you have a new driver in the house, you go back to worrying about it for a while. But I can also tell you as I have older, an older driver, after a while, you're able to sleep again. So the first thing is you have to put on your own oxygen mask first, just like they told us, you remember airplanes, right? Um, back in the day when we were on airplanes. So yes, I know, me too. So you have to look at your own anxiety, figure out what you can control. Just like remember the first time you and I got to talk on Momentum Boost, Adrian, I said, when you're really worried about something that's real, you have to examine it and figure out what you can control and what you can't control. And do your best to give yourself time and space for the feelings that you have. But then when you're ready for action, focus on the things you can control. And so that may mean that your family doesn't emerge at the same pace that you're seeing some people on that 11 o'clock news emerge. And that's mm -hmm. okay. But I'm gonna encourage you to remember that you have to, as, as my mom of blessed memory would say, begin as you mean to go on. So we are going to have to go on. There are gonna be dips and peaks in how much we're able to engage with other people. But for example, if connecting with your family on Shabbat is important to you, then look for ways, given what you know about the virus, that you can do that as safely as possible, but do that. For a lot of people, stay at home, shelter in place was more comfortable because even if we hated the parameters, we had parameters. Oh, we could so just right. say to our kids, it's terrible, but you gotta stay in the box. And now we do have to poke our heads out of the box and figure out how to navigate the wider world again with new information and a lot of new feelings. 
and not judging our fellow for doing it in a different pace or time that we do, I would imagine as well. I mean, we yeah. all judge. When my kids say don't judge, I always say to them, you have to use your judgment or you're going to get grounded. So I do want, for example, my kids to judge their friends. What we mean when we say don't judge is we mean don't be a jerk. Understand that there's this, this great meme I saw that says uh, someone's life, what you know about someone's life. So you might see someone out and about and you think, oh my gosh, what's that person doing trying to walk into that pharmacy with no mask? But you might not know that they left a child having an active asthma attack in the car and they forgot the mask because they're so scared or that they themselves have an asthma attack every time they put on their mask and they're really just running in to get their inhaler and running back out and they couldn't bear to put it on. It's not to say that they shouldn't try and that we don't, aren't impacted by them not wearing a mask. It's just to say, and I wanted to say this earlier, I think this is really important for us as parents, our kids about empathy, our kids can have all the empathy they want because we don't have rules about feelings. But like I say, every time we talk, we should have rules about behavior, both as a society and as families. So if your child is mourning camp or whatever experience they didn't get to have, we should have empathy for their feelings, but they don't get to behave however which way they want because of those feelings. Right, right, wow. You know, honestly, um, I wish we had more time because I have a lot of questions and there's, there's, there's just, this is scary, but you are, as always, someone just wrote in the chat. I love Dr. G. I wish I could put her in my pocket. <laughs> you really are a master. Uh, this has been so helpful, so tangibly, practically helpful. I and, really and appreciate I it. And I just want to say, it's really easy, as you guys all know, to have great ideas about other people's parenting. It doesn't mean I get it right all the time, but it also means that you have the wisdom and the experience and the calm that you need to navigate this. It is simply a question of tapping into it inside you and having some faith in it. 